a question that I want to start off with this morning is this. How can you tell if a church is successful? I know you probably don't really think about that much. Maybe you do. I don't know. I think about it all the time. How can you tell whether a church is being successful? Some churches measure success with the three B's. Maybe you've heard of the three B's. Butts, buildings, and budgets. So, you know, how many butts are in the seats? How, how, how big is a church budget? And, you know, how large is the church building, the facility? And, you know, so maybe that's how churches measure. I know churches measure success in those ways, in those three B's, butts, budgets, buildings. Uh, maybe a, a church can measure success uh, by what a church offers, like the programming that a church has to offer. Are exciting things happening in the life of a church? Another way to measure success is possibly um, how engaging is the pastor sermons. Is the pastor boring or not? That's a way to measure success. Is, is the pastor, you know, engaging? Is he knowledgeable? Are, are the worship services inspirational? These are, are ways that churches often measure success. I think a better question to ask is, how can you tell if a church is being faithful? I think that's the better question. How can you tell if a church is being faithful? Because I don't believe the goal is success in the church world. I think the goal is faithfulness. Faithfulness to what God has called us to. Faithfulness to who he's called us to be as a church. Faithfulness. How do we measure that? That's something that we're going to look at. And, and that's why at Living Grace, we talk a lot about our, about our mission. And our mission's a simple one, following Jesus together. We, we just want to follow Jesus together. And together is a very, very important word because we can't follow Jesus. You can't live a Christian life, a faithful Christian life, on your own. It's something that has to be done in community. It's a together thing, following Jesus together. And we, you know, at Living Grace, say that it happens in this way, becoming belonging and blessing becoming like jesus belonging uh, to the, the family to to the body to, to true authentic relationships building into one another's lives and shaping being shaped in community uh, that's the becoming and then or the belonging and then blessing sharing his good news of blessing to our world to our community to our workplaces, our homes, becoming, belonging, and blessing. That's, that's what we're about. That's our, our mission. And, and so we, there are strategic times throughout the year that we can talk about the mission, and one of those strategic times is at the very beginning of, of the year. And so if you've been around Living Grace for a while, you know that uh, I think almost every year we have a series on our mission. And then uh, in, at the end of the summer, towards heading into the fall, we usually have another series as well where we specifically address our mission as a church. And then we talk about it a lot throughout the year. So here we are in January at the beginning of the year, and we're going to have another series on our mission just to keep it in front of our minds. What are we about as a church? Becoming, belonging, blessing, following Jesus together. And, uh, and so the goal of this series is pretty simple. I want us to be more faithful in who he's called us to be and what he's called us to do. Becoming, belonging, blessing. And so I, I want everyone who calls Living Grace their home, their family, their church, to, to commit to, to following Jesus together in, in a, an intimate group of believers that grow in these three ways, in his word, with his people, on his mission, becoming, belonging, and blessing. That's, that's the goal. And so if you have questions about how we do that, our primary focus here at Living Grace is our community groups and growing in these three ways. If you have questions about that throughout this series, let me know. We, we have several community groups uh, happening now in the life of Living Grace, and we want, we want more to be a part of that. But that's, that's the goal of the series, that we all would grow in these, in these ways. So last week, Brian led us in a service the, uh, uh, where we 
where you discussed following Jesus together and dreaming of, of how, can, how can we do this? How can we do this better as a people? How can we be more faithful and fruitful in following Jesus together? And today we're going to focus on the becoming. And we often say it around here that we are becoming like the Word through the Word. We're becoming like the Word made flesh through His Word. And this is a story about the Word. This is a story about Jesus. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I've, I've grown up in the church. How many of you have just grown up in the church? You've just been around. You just, this is all you know. is the church many of us have. And so I was practically born in the church. And not, you know, literally. But uh, anytime the doors were open, we were there. Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights. I was a part of the youth group all my life. Uh, I attended a Christian school my entire life. Elementary, middle school, high school, college, grad school, theological training. So, so I have had um, so much Bible training. I've been a part of countless Bible studies all throughout my years. And, and been a part of Bible classes. Many, just so many throughout my years. And and so I'm almost 50 years old, and I know, that's kind of strange, but I, it's only in the last handful of years that I've been challenged to read the Word, study the Word, to approach the Word in a different way. I've been challenged. I think there are are more faithful ways to approach the study of God's Word. This is what I've been learning, and that's what I want to talk about today as we read, as we study, as we, as, we, as we teach it, as we preach it. I think there's a more faithful way to approach the Word. And I think in that faithful way of approaching the Word, we'll see more fruitful lives, we'll see more fruitful church growth, we'll see more fruitful kingdom growth. And that's what I want to discuss a little bit today. So th for the majority of my life, I have seen the Bible as something to figure out. I've kind of seen it as something to figure out. You know, I've approached it in that way. It's kind of like a, a mysterious code that we have to unlock. So that's how I've approached the Scriptures for the majority of my life, to figure it out, to find the answers, to, to gain a proper theology, to figure things out so that I can teach others to find the answers so that I can share the answers with others. And, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. There are things to figure out. There are answers to be found. There is theology to be shaped. Theology is very important. We'll talk more about that next week. But there are dangers in approaching the Scriptures in this way. And I want to talk about a few of those dangers here. If we approach the scriptures in that way, just as something to figure out, answers to be found, then um, it will also lead us, it will often lead us to a lack of growth. Because once you think you've got things figured out, once you think you have the correct answer, the correct understanding, and you have the, you have the correct theology, then what? Then what? I mean, it can often lead to a lack of openness to other theological perspectives, other good theological perspectives, other historical theological perspectives. And when that happens, it can often lead us to stop pursuing, stop growing, stop maturing in our faith. That's a danger. It can also lead to self-righteousness and arrogance. I've got it right. I've got the right perspective. I figured it out. I, I have the correct theology. They don't. Beware of them. And this is why Paul says that knowledge puffs up. But it's love that builds up. It can also lead sometimes to, to lead us to put God in our man-made boxes. You know, actually make an idol of our beliefs and an idol of our theology. Think about that for a little bit. It can, it can lead us to make God into our image. It can lead us to try to control him with our theology and our beliefs. And I know we don't think of it that way, but that's, that's sometimes what we do. We try to control him with what we believe 
and with our theology and what we think. It can often lead to a love for the Bible over, over and beyond a love for the God of the Bible. I've seen this in my own life. I see this in the life, lives of other believers. It can lead to being committed to a particular pastor, a particular uh, pastor and his teaching and his theology, his particular interpretation of Scripture, his or her. You know, so basically, you know, if, if, if I like what I hear, if it sounds right, if I agree with it, then that's my, that's my guy, that's my girl, that's who I'm going to pay attention to. Others, I'm not necessarily going to pay attention to what they have to say. Now, one question that I think we really need to wrestle with is this. What's more powerful, the Word or what a pastor or teacher has to say about the Word? I mean, think about that. What's more powerful, the Word of God itself or what someone has to say about it? Their interpreta interpretation and their teaching. The Word of God is the only thing that's inspired. The Word of God is inspired, not a particular theology, not a, inter a particular interpretation, and nothing anyone has to say or write about it. The Word itself is inspired. So, I want to let you in on a little secret. Well, it's not—I I don't think it's a secret, actually. I, um, I think I've probably said this before, but the more I grow in my faith, the more questions I have. And I don't know how you feel about that. Maybe you're ready to get up and walk out and, you know, when I'm not looking, or maybe you want to go find a, a different church, because I know that we, we want our pastors to have the answer, and we want our pastors to be able to convey, convey the right answers. But some other questions that I really think we need to consider is, you know, how, how big is God? Let's think about that. How big is God? Do I really think I can figure him out? Do I really think I can truly comprehend his vastness, understand his mind and his ways? Do you think I can? Do you think you can? Do you think anyone can? How, how big? How big is your God? In Isaiah, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And Paul says in Romans, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths, beyond tracing out who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor. I like what Paul also says in 1 Corinthians. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Someday, and I can't wait for this, we're going to know, we're going to truly know. For, for now, though, we're so limited in our, our knowledge and our understanding. In the book Prince Caspian, Oh, one of the Chronicles of Narnia books, you know, by C.S. Lewis. How many of you read the, that book or the series? Yeah, I love, I love the series. Read, read it several times. In, in that particular book, Lucy, the young girl, uh, is approaching Aslan, the great lion. She runs to Aslan. She throws his arms, her, her arms around him, and she says, Aslan, you just seem so much bigger to me. And Aslan replies, every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And that's what it's like when we study the scriptures. That's what it's like when we try to contemplate God and who he is. It's like an ocean. It's like an ocean. The, the, the further you swim, the deeper it gets. There, there's so much that lies beneath the surface. The more you know, the more, more you realize you don't know. And we're so limited. We're so limited in our, our sinful, finite theological perspectives and underst understanding. God is unfathomable. He's vast. He's eternal. He's bigger than we can even imagine. How big? How big is your God? And so I believe that a more faithful way to approach the Bible is, is uh, not necessarily to, to get the answers, but to get God himself. 
I mean, this is what God wants for us. This is what God wants with us to, to, to wade deeper into relationship. And so when we, we approach the Bible in this way, you know, not in a, a formal school-like classroom, find the answer so that you can pass the test kind of way, but in a relational way, we're, we're learning, we're learning to catch a, a grander vision of God and who he is, which leads us to greater awe and wonder of our creator. It, it leads us deeper in worship. This is ultimately where our study of the Bible should lead us in greater awe and wonder and worship of our creator. Wow, what, what a God. What a God. Now, as I think about teaching the Bible and studying the Bible, I think for, the, for most of my life, I've, and I think we do this in the church world a lot, we confuse biblical knowledge with spiritual maturity. I think we do this a lot. I know I have. We, we confuse biblical knowledge with spiritual maturity. And I think in the church world, we are so enamored with great preachers, you know, people who can teach the Bible really well, who know the scriptures really well. And so we, we put these people on a pedestal sometimes, but often what we don't pay attention to is what matters most, and that's a person's character. And so... I know a lot of what I've done over the years. I've consumed a lot of content, taken in a lot of information. You know, I think that, that listening to sermons and reading books and listening to a podcast and attending Bible studies and, and consuming all this, this information is, is how I grow towards spiritual maturity. And that's often the approach that we take. But maturity is not measured in how much we know. Maturity is measured in how much we love. Maturity is about character transformation. It's about humility. It's about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Maturity is looking more and more like Jesus. That is spiritual maturity. And so if we follow the storyline of the Bible, we go back to the very beginning, we see that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God to be his representatives. But they were unfaithful in that calling. We're going to talk more about that here in a few minutes. But they were unfaithful. Then you have the Israelite people throughout the Old Testament. They were given the law to set them apart from the nations and to help them represent God well to the nations. And they were unfaithful in their calling. And when you read through the scriptures, you just see this cycle of an unfaithfulness over and over and over again. And so when I approach the scriptures... When I, when I read it, when I study it, when I, when I preach it, or when I listen to someone else preach, as I go deeper, as I go deeper, and I learn to swim in the depths, I'm gaining a, pic, a bigger picture of, of who God is through his word. I'm also being confronted with what I'm not. I'm confronted with my unfaithfulness time and time again. I, I'm Adam and Eve. I'm just like the Israelites. But when we keep reading, we can, we can see, you know, we can be thankful. I mean, thank God for Jesus, right? I mean, he, he's the only faithful one. And he's the perfect image bearer. And so as we approach the word of God, we also see a perfect picture of who God created us to be and who God called us to be through Jesus. Through Jesus, this this all points to him. This all points to him. And it's, it's only through Jesus that we, that that can be a reality in our lives. Becoming like the word through the word. So I think a, a more faithful way to approach the, the, the scriptures is not just to, to gain uh, information and more knowledge and to shape our theology, but to shape our lives. To shape our very lives. God, shape me. Shape me. Conform me. Conform me into the image of Jesus. The author of Hebrews said, The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. If we want to know what God is like, we just look at Jesus. And we follow the example of Jesus. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians, and 
And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory or reflect the Lord's glory, it may show in another, another uh, translations. Unveiled faces, what's this talking about? Well, maybe you, you recall a story from the Old Testament when, when Moses went up on the mountain on, uh, to Mount Sinai and he was hanging out with God and he was receiving the law. You know, he's in the presence of God and then he comes down to, the, comes down to, to be with the people and his face is just glowing. It's so brilliant that they're, they're just frightened. They're scared to death. They can't even look at him. And so the, he, he puts a veil on his face. But not us. We, we're, we're reflecting this glory of God with, with unveiled faces now. We're being transformed into, into his image with ever-increasing glory. How cool is that? Which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Through God's Spirit at work in us as we approach the Bible, we're not just getting smarter, getting more information, and gaining new insights. We're being transformed into the image of Jesus. Reflecting the glory of God more and more and more, which is what was intended for us from the very beginning. Finally, for most of my life, and I'm, I'm like, like I said, I'm sharing these experiences that I've had, and, and maybe some of you can relate to that, maybe you can't. For most of my life, I've, I've seen the Bible, um, I've seen Bible study as, as an activity confined, confined to either the privacy of my home, own home, my life, like personal devotions, personal Bible readings, personal Bible study, like, like that, or, or, you know, group Bible studies confined to the, to wall, to the walls of the church. And in other words, you know, I think sometimes we approach the Bible in a way that limits its activity. You know, it's, it's something Christians are supposed to do for, for our enjoyment, for our benefit, for our growth. You know, it's about me, or it's about us. And yes, that's absolutely true, but there's so much more to it. There's so much more to it. In the mid-1400s, the printing press was invented. I don't know if you remember that from, you know, your school days, from history classes or whatever, but the printing press, and that changed a whole lot. So it, up until the mid-1400s, the majority of Christians didn't have Bibles. I mean, think about that. So for, for most of church history, Christians didn't even have their own Bibles. They, they couldn't study the Bible on their own. Personal devotions weren't such a thing. There wasn't, wasn't such a thing as personal devotions. Bible reading was a, a corporate experience. Now, there are some, some big implications for this. I just want to talk about a couple. Um, the other thing I want to mention, too, though, is when we, we look in the Scriptures themselves, we see how, the, how God's law, um, how the prophets, how the, how the letters were, were read, how they were conveyed to the people. They were conveyed in a corporate manner. Lots of examples of this. So Moses comes down from, from the mountain. He has God's law, and he reads the law to the people corporately, the entire group of people. And then later we read that the Israelites are supposed to read the entire law in front of the, the gathering of people every, seven, every seven, seven years. And then as they entered into the promised land, Joshua reads the law to the people corporately. Later on, King Josiah reads the law in front of the people. These are Old Testament examples. There are several. There's also some examples in the New Testament, specifically the letters of the Apostle Paul. We studied the letter of Ephesians this past year. These letters were sent to the churches, circulated among the churches, and they were read aloud in the gatherings. So, like I said, a couple implications. The first one is that God's word has to be prominent in our lives, front and center, but it's not just a personal, private matter. There's something God that is doing in us. There's something God is doing among us in our worship gatherings on Sunday and in our, in our groups throughout the week as we read the scriptures together, as we wrestle what God is trying to communicate to us. And like I said, we'll talk more about that next week. But I think there's, 
There's a greater implication about this that we need to think about. What was the purpose of these public readings of Scripture? Why did they even need to hear the law? Why did they even need to hear the word? What was the significance of it? The significance of the purpose of the law? It wasn't, it wasn't just for their benefit. Back to Adam and Eve. Created in the image of God. And they were given a law to live by, right? Don't eat from that particular tree. Why? Why would God tell? Was God just toying with them? No, God, God knows what's best. And he wanted them to continually experience his presence, and he wanted them to represent him well as his image bearers. Why were the Israelite people given the law? Not because God likes rules. I mean, some people approach the Bible in that way or see the Bible as, you know, God's just given me a bunch of rules to live by and to keep me from having fun. No, he, he gave them the law to set them apart from the other nations, but also to help them represent him faithfully to the nations. That was, that was the, the goal, to, to be representatives to the nations, to be a light to the nations, to bring God's blessing to the nations. That was the purpose. That was the reason. So why do we read? Why do we study? Why do we teach the word? So that we can be the people God's called us to be and that we can, we can live faithfully in the calling that he has for us. All scripture is God-breathed, Paul said to Timothy. Is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thor thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's, there's work to do. And what we studied earlier last year, what, for we are God's handiwork. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. This has been the purpose God has for us all along. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you are the light of the world, and you is plural, the people of God. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a, under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Glorify your Father in heaven. I think a more faithful way to approach the Bible is to locate ourselves in the big story of God's mission. It's what God has always been up to in our world from the very beginning. It's not just about me. It's not just about you. It's not just about us. It's about what God is doing among us and what God is doing through us. And, and we talk about this a lot around here, but do we really believe it? That, that God is at work fixing our broken world. He's at work fixing our broken world. He's at work rescuing his people and all of creation. He's at work setting things right, making things new. That's what God is doing. That is what he's always been doing. Revelation, the, the revelation given to John. It says, he who was seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. I'm at work making everything new, God says. So John Write this down. Write it down. For these words are trustworthy and true. I want everyone to know what I'm at work doing. So write it down. This, this is what the Bible is all about. This is the story that we read about from beginning to end. This is the grand narrative. The grand narrative that we are all invited to participate in. It's huge. It's incredible. As we read it, as we study it, as we learn it, as we hear it preached and, and taught, this is what we're invited to participate in. This huge story. So to conclude and kind of wrap things up, just a, a quick review. I think a more faithful way to approach the scriptures is not necessarily to get answers, but to get God himself. It's about relationship, a deeper relationship that should lead us deeper into worship. 
I think a more faithful way to approach the scriptures is not just to gain a lot of knowledge and information or just to shape our theology, but to shape our lives. And that should result in transfer transformation into the image of Jesus. And not just as individuals or individual churches, but to locate ourselves in this big story of God's mission. And that should lead us to participation. And that should lead us to kingdom growth, kingdom fruitfulness. So some questions as we wrap up. Some questions that I think, I think we should kind of ask every time we read the Bible, study the Bible, every time we hear it taught. Just a few questions that I think would be helpful. What is this telling me about God? How is this leading me to worship my Creator? Am I seeing a bigger picture? Am I gaining a greater all of God through this text? As I grow in my faith, I'm learning to be okay with saying, I don't know. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. But wow, what a God. Wow, what a God. I mean, ultimately, this is where our Bible study should lead us, to greater awe and wonder and worship of our Creator. That's ultimately where it should lead. How is this challenging me? How does this challenge the way I see God and, and his world? How can I be further shaped around God's kingdom values? Am I looking more and more like Jesus? See, you know, maybe I can, you know, teach a passage of scripture well or preach it well, maybe. But if I'm not becoming more humble... And I, I've got to change my approach. If I'm attending a Bible study week after week after week and I'm not becoming more patient with my spouse or my family, something's missing. If my theology and my doctrine doesn't lead me to a greater love for my neighbors, what's the use? What's the use? Paul says, I'm, I'm just a resounding gong. A lot of information, a lot of knowledge. The last set of questions, how does what I'm reading fit into the big story of the Bible? How is what I'm reading, this specific text, this specific verse, fit into this, this grand narrative of the Bible? And, and as I locate myself in this big story, what is this asking of me? How is this leading me to participate in God's mission? You know, and as... As we've said many times before, God is doing something in me and God is doing something in you. He's doing something in us so that ultimately he can do something through us in the world. And so reading and studying the Bible should always lead us outwards, beyond ourselves. It should always lead, lead us towards others. A greater love for one another, and a greater love for our neighbors, I mean, look at the example of the early church. And they just didn't just sit around talking about the words of Jesus and studying the words of Jesus. They obeyed the words of Jesus. They followed in the footsteps of Jesus. They participated in this, this big story of what God was up to in the world. And they gave their lives to a cause greater than themselves. And I'm thankful they did that because we're here now. 2,000 years later. I think that's pretty incredible. So I think as we study God's word, as we read God's word, these are more faithful ways of approaching the scriptures that will lead us to bear more fruit. Individually, yes. As a church body. And I think especially what's important is more kingdom fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. 